We'll wait for Justin to finish typing. There we go. Hey, everybody. How's it going? I am Jeff with Fuller Embroidery Works. We have Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios. <coughs> and today, my files are not working. Justin, I just sent you um, a file over in Discord if you could grab that. Uh, in the meantime, we'll go ahead and catch up on the comments. We have Cindy King joining us from Odessa, Texas. We have uh, Kingsbury Crafts. Hello. Uh, Mike Muldowney. Let's get after it. Woo. Hello, Mr. Mike. Um, we have Jetsy Gibson checking in. Hello. Uh, Mike says, I just noticed a random presser foot in the opening title card. It totally keeps pairs of those around. We definitely do, too. Uh, we have TMG Custom De Designs checking in. Hello. We have Suzanne from Newport, R Rhode Island. Uh, we have Mr. Frank Muldowney. No, Frank Dunn. <laughs> I'm never going to live that one down. We have Frank Dunn joining us from the U.K., um, and there we go. I believe that's everybody that I got caught up And today. Uh, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. So, uh, the very first year that we did embroidery nerd, I want to say it was the first year, might've been the second. I'm, I'm old and can't remember stuff. Um, we did our t-shirt design. So it was this wireframe, um, and it was actually a 3d render, not a 3d render. It was actually a stitch file that was converted over into vector. Um, and did the design based off of that. So this year, uh, for those of you that don't know, our last year's file that we did was, we'll see if I can find it. Um, it was the embroidery nerd and it was stacked vertically. Uh, and the nerd kind of looks like glasses. I'm actually pretty proud of that one because... <laughs> um, I might've come up with it. I'm not going to toot my own horn a little bit there, but I may have come up with it. So right now I'm just looking at, um, I'm trying to get a file over to Justin so, uh, he can look at it and tell me what changes we need to make to it. Um, if I can do that. And for some reason, my Corel will not let me export to a EPS file, Justin. Really? That's fun. And there it went, and I was able to do that. So let me grab that real quick here, and I'll get that sent over to you. And then I will pull up my software. Um, it would help, Justin, if I knew where I saved the file. <laughs> totally ready for this, um, as you guys can't tell. So there we go, and I need to do it to the X desktop do that and that and there we go and send that over and eventually it'll open um for justin there we go so it it totally did not happen that when i was getting ready for this um my software didn't crash totally didn't happen at all um like eight seconds before we went live never so, Let's uh, go ahead and do a present and I'm going to share my screen and actually I should move this over here so that you guys cannot see my super top secret stuff. Well, you guys don't need to see the stream yard area. Um, I mean, technically, I don't think I need to see it either, but sometimes I do. So this is what we're going to go for today. We're going to I'm going to show you the process that I used impulse to get this up um, to where we have our stitch file. So close that out because I don't need to save that. And I'm not gonna save that. And we'll see where we go. So here we are where we've got our text up here and I've already scaled this text, I've brought it in and I've, I've scaled it down where our end result is gonna be five, no, 10 inches wide, right, Justin? Yes. All right, so our end result is going to be 10 inches wide. Now, the problem that we run into with this specifically is we have really, really wide spots here. Um, and that's going to stop us. Aha, there we go. So that we're getting like 14, 15 millimeters here. So that if we digitize this any larger, we're going to end up with trims on those areas. And it's not going to generate the stitches in those areas. And that's what we, we need it to do in order for us to convert the vector. So I shrank it down um, 
to half of what the, the final size is going to be so that we could digitize it at uh, basically a scale. And Justin is looking at the file that I sent him and going, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this is this awesome. Because <laughs> he's totally thinking that. I can see in his head. All right. So I have this all set up. We can go ahead and come up here. We can start with the T. Um, one thing to note is that for screen print, you need your lines need a thickness, right, Justin? That's correct. You know what that thickness is? I do not. I can kind of tell what, um, especially it, it kind of ranges to what color print you're doing on what color shirts. Like if you're doing a dark print on a light shirt, you can get away with a little bit thinner lines than you would, you know, depending on the screen mesh that you're going with. So, um, okay. I know last year when we were, when we were dealing with this, we were actually trying to do it kind of in reverse where we were trying to loosen up the density. So it really got that stitch look because uh, you know a loose density in digitizing that we do uh, is still you know outputting it into a vector art those stitches are still closer together as far as print wise so they're going to bleed together not going to have that effect so we actually had to over exaggerate that that loose density to get that zigzag stitch effect i hope that you guys can see that i changed it to red um to go over the top of the black so i went ahead and i've digitized this object now in order for us because we're going to go for that wireframe look again right justin correct okay just wanted to make sure that we were on the same page here um so this object it does not have any underlay on it right now uh assigned but we do have our travel stitches so when you do wireframe you know we, we obviously want it to look like what it's supposed to but we also kind of want it to look like stitches a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to keep those traveling stitches to a minimum um, because we we don't really want to see those. It's not really the focus of the design. Um, but it's also, I want to say we left them in in this one a little bit. Um, and leaving them in kind of will, I guess, reminisce about the uh, the actual way that it would stitch. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to edit and I'm going to grab my start and my stop point. I'm going to put them there. I'm going to hit G to generate the stitches. And then again, I'm going to have my start point there. And I'm going to have to have a travel stitch there somewhere. And so I'll go ahead and place it over there. And that's going to set that object. So it's basically going to start here. It's going to work its way up. It's going to come across. And then we have a trim. Um, and I can assign trims in this. You know, I can tell it. It's going to try and do auto trim. So if the distance is a certain uh, width, I guess, it's going to try to automatically trim on that um, and apply a lock stitch. So I prefer to apply my lock stitches um, myself. So uh, well, I went ahead and it, it all depends on, I mean, we could leave the travel stitches in and anybody that knows embroidery and sees the print is going to know and of why it's there, or do you want to trim every single element that you have so there's no travel stitches at all? Well, I was gonna leave the I was gonna leave them there. Okay. Um, the goal, I guess, was is to just have minimum travel stitches. Gotcha. But I was gonna leave, leave them there because if I came and I brought this start point back up to here, we're gonna have a travel run that's gonna go right down that center because mm -hmm. it'll travel down there and then it'll come back up. So I was kind of my my thought was is to leave them minimal. But I'm open to feedback on this because I'm going to have to change it later anyways. <laughs> so what do you think, Justin? Either way, I mean, it kind of gives it a unique look. I'm just looking at the, the EPS file you sent me. Mm -hmm. And it's only here and there that you're going to get those travel stitches. But it, it kind of, anybody that knows embroidery is going to get it. So that's kind of cool. And since the crowd that we're going to be selling these two are generally embroidered. So I think that'd be cool. Yeah. So I'm just digitizing. I'm using the satin path tool. Um, I'm tracing the outline here. One of the really, really cool things that I like and I use it all the time is when I get to the end of an object, so I'm just going to press shift. We'll come up to there and we'll go, we'll start going around. You can actually see the, 
the curve handles there. So that's kind of cool. Um, and it helps me know where to go and, but when I get to the end there, I can hit the O key and that's going to close it. And then I can throw in my stitch angles and it does, I don't know. It looks like it tries to do a closest join type thing. Um, but it's not throwing it where I would put it. So we'll go ahead and generate and then I'll grab and move my start point there. And then obviously my end point is going to go over here. We'll check here. So our start point is, um, up here and our end point is up there too which if we were doing this to actually embroider it we'd have our start point be there and our end point be there and this is kind of the difference that you can see um, in software is some software would uh, tie in here run down and hit this little bit of underlay and then run back up and come down where this is going to come down to here and then it's going to run over and it's going to come back up so with every software, you get kind of that uniqueness of how this software is going to react when it comes and it does these types of things. Um, and this that's is how it does it. It's an FYI. Whatever density you used on that file you sent me, mm -hmm. you're going to want to open it up more. Oh, I know. That's standard density. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, so how much are you thinking more? Uh... So what do you have it at 0.4? Yeah, somewhere around there. I'd go up to 0.8 and see what it says, see what it looks like. All right. So I'm going to go around here and I'm just going to get this shape. And for some reason, I think I, this is actually part of a font. So it treats that. I don't think I threw it as a complete outline. And so it does that kind of weird box around it. Um, I don't get that with the letters that I really modified. So I'm guessing... That's what that is. So I'm going to come there, close off my shape. Now with this, I can actually come in and I can set a hole in the middle at the same time. Um, so I'm going to have an outline shape there and an outline shape on the inside. And then when I go ahead and hit enter, I'm, I'm left with my shape. And now I can come in and I'm applying my stitch angles here. And we're going to deal with that here in just a second. First, we're going to go... Uh, there and can't do that that way <laughs> uh, come in like that and we'll put one right here and now we've got this weird angle here we can add a virtual slice so we're just going to tell it we want it to cut right there and now we've got our E um, and again I'm going to grab both of these objects here while I'm here and I'm going to add my end command as a trim. So if I did these as a lock stitch, which I could do, um, if I did, if I added lock stitches into this, every stitch is going to be a node in the end. So I don't want to add, you know, too many lock stitches. And I, I try to keep the excess, the number of excess stitches down just because it's gonna end up being a node in the long run. And I wanna make sure that we're not putting too much in there. You can stop me when you have questions, Justin. No, you're fine, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so we've done that there. I'm not, I don't have to worry about push and pull because it's a screen print and I'll come here and I'll draw my object. Just kind of keep going here. And I'll bring that up and there. And I'll hit enter again. And now I can draw my next object. And we just kind of move down through the different letters. And I mean, this is really digitizing. We pretty much just trace everything and then give it properties. So let me know if we have any questions. Um, Let me look here. Sorry, I was on a different screen. Um, Cindy, what is the exact definition of wireframe? Have at it, Justin. Uh, what were you talking about when you were referring to it as far as wireframe and digitizing or? That's when I, when I was talking about wireframe, um, for me, it's not 3D view. Right. So if I bring so why, up 3D view. 
wireframe uh, when it comes to digitizing is concerned there's different ways of, of viewing your design on screen so there's typically a standard view like he's digitizing in there where you can kind of see a somewhat just uh, accurate depiction as far as the stitches that he's that he's plotting um, there's the 3d version where it kind of gives you a computer rendering of what it looks like in actual embroidery and then wireframe or typically is they'll take each element that he's digitized and it'll actually just show the outline of that. Um, a lot of times that's that's used if you wanna see details of the artwork that's in the background on your, on your backdrop. So you just do a wireframe and then there's no stitches, no nodes, no not, anything that's gonna get in your way as far as your view. Um, as far as artwork's concerned, that's pretty much the same. Uh, you can see something in a wireframe, so you're just seeing just the outline of all the elements. You're not seeing any of the fill colors or whatnot. Uh, mainly used if you're trying to see different layers in artwork or your your set backdrop for for embroidery. And Maldo's got a really important question here. What's for dinner? Buying hamburgers. <laughs> I don't know yet. So. <laughs> Here go. we go. We got Matthew. Wireframe is from the 3D modeling software where instead of seeing real textures, they see lines that show the vertices and the shapes of shapes. Uh, we say wireframe when we're just talking about seeing the stitches. There is a technical definition for you there, Cindy, by the tech man himself, Matthew. See, even when he's not here in his presence, gracing our presence, he's He's helping in the comments. Probably keep him around. And I'm just moving. I start my stop points around so that this would actually flow like it would in a digitized design. Um, and we can hit the 3D view here. So this is what we've got so far. That's a really weird corner. I'm not I'm gonna ignore it for now. <laughs> um, but this is just kind of this is the input mode that I'm using. I'm using the satin path. I could use the digitize or the enhanced column, which would be a lot more like um, column A. Column A in Wilcom, where it would be left side, right side. And your stitch angle would be in between. Um, every software has, they call it something different. Um, but they all kind of have the base, the same basic input tools um, for every software. So that would be, if I did it in column B, it would do that. Uh, I, I end up with, what, four stitch angles in there because I had to put four, four nodes. Where mm -hmm. if I do it in the enhanced column, which I'm going to get rid of this trim because that's going to drive me, or put a trim in because that's going to drive me nuts. Where if I do the enhanced column, I can get away with doing less uh, stitch angles, um, even if I have to add more nodes. So I'll, I, I tend to use this when I draw uh, and trace, and then I add my stitch angles um, from there. Do you tend to use this input more than the other? More than what? more than the uh the basic point counterpoint i do impulse i do um it depends on the software mm -hmm. uh, i found it it's easier to digitize impulse like this and so i i tend to do it in pulse when i go to wilcom i'll use the column a column b and a lot of that is um when i'm doing it in pulse I'm also working at getting the vector line or the vector with it. So a lot of times I'll export the vector and I like to have it. Um, I like to have it closed on the end. So in Wilcom, when you do the point and the counterpoint, and I believe in this, when you point counterpoint, you can't necessarily close your object. It leaves that one end open. And so when I use the uh, satin path here, I'm able to close the outside edges of my objects. And then if I want to convert it to a vector, it's really, really easy. Um, 
That's my why as to why I use this tool. Here we got a question from Maldo. Jeff, now that you have a pretty good seat time and with most of the software packages, which one do you gravitate to the most? <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, it, it really depends on what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, I've been using Pulse a lot actually lately uh, and Floriani. So I've been, I've been preparing a lot of um, vector objects and I can do it in these softwares a little bit easier than I can Wilcom. So I've been using Pulse a lot more lately uh, as well as, um, I mean, I, I use Wilcom too. I have a lot of designs in Wilcom. <laughs> Yeah, as as you do too. So, um, I tend to use Wilcom because I've got a lot of files in there. But when I'm doing something from scratch, I'll use Pulls. And today I'm going to grab that little green dot and bring it down there. There we go. And Justin's making sure that we have questions. And so far, Matthew says, is this the new font? Um, we're not going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Primarily because I don't know. I think it is. Um, I think it is. I know I did my desktop background I did in Pulse. Um, and I'll show that to you guys here in a second. And it was the old font that I used on my desktop background. But I do believe this one, I don't remember when we changed our font. This is the same art file that we did last year's shirts in. So if last year's shirts were in the new font, then yes, this would be the new font. If not, then no, this is not the new font. Um, and he would ask me that too, live and on air and everything, Justin throw me under the bus. Oh, so this is the, the art that we did last year. I knew it looked familiar. Yeah. It's just not a... Uh... It's different. It's, um, it's not stitched. Right. Yeah. We did a, a solid print there. last year. Oh, yeah. That's Corel. That's the one that's frozen on me. Yeah, get rid um, of that. But that's, the, that's my desktop background. And I did this in um, Pulse as well, using the same technique that we're going to be, we'll be using today. And I just have to be mindful of the time, Justin, because I'm probably going to need, we might have to do a revision or two on the density. Okay. And so I want to make sure that, because I have that, I have the other file that's digitized already up there and ready to go. Um Yeah, Pulse is doing some weird stuff with that art. I think, honestly, I think it's the uh, the way that I have the letters. I think they're in the art file as true type. Oh, okay. As individual letters. So it's adding the um, bounding box to it every now and again when I scale. Gotcha. Um, so I think that's a me thing. So, yeah, there's there's going to be some, some quirks here and there, too, when you're using vector art whenever you bring it into your digitized software next to a raster file like a JPEG or a G PNG or something like that, where it's a flat image, so you're not going to have any chatter or anything like this. Um, the way that the digitizing software is going to recognize a vector file. There's some times where I even get a vector file that may be saved in a really old version or different ways of, of saving it through different softwares that when you bring it in, it kind of has these weird, how it interprets the code or whatnot. Um, but sometimes you get this kind of weird stuff. So it kind of makes sense though, if it is reading some of the information being a true type font and not lines and curves. Yeah. And I'm pretty positive that that's exactly what it is, is a true type font. Um, 
because I noticed the same thing with the uh, the artifacts that you're seeing, and I didn't have a chance to check it, but this is something that I see a lot, and it doesn't really matter the program. I tend to see it in all the programs when you bring in a uh, EPS file or uh, like all the digitizing programs. It, it it's not unique to this one. Um, it's, it's, tend to see it in all the others and we'll go ahead and bring that over that to there that to there we'll make sure that that's there so that's good and the last e we did was up there so i'm just going to redo it and the important part is is i just don't follow the artifacts i guess <laughs> <laughs> that I'm looking exactly. at the vector line that I want to follow and I'm making sure I follow it. There there was one um, on the larger letters that I had to go look at and look at the actual art to see which line I needed to follow. Um, totally didn't mess that up. I guess I could have just fixed it by the easy way, but I forget that I have tools to fix this kind of stuff because so <laughs> often it's faster for you to just recreate it than it is to go through and there, and there, close, generate. That one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, there, and then I'm going to put my virtual slice in, From there to there, and now we have that E, the R I can duplicate, so and adjust my start and my stop point here to there and there and I'll add a trim command and then I'm I mean there's no sense in duplicating my work but I can duplicate the letter oops I only select that letter there we go and we'll duplicate it here and just drop it right on top of the art right there and now we're left with the Y. So maybe you finish up digitizing the Y and then we'll go to the, your, your finished one and yeah. start manipulating uh, densities and whatnot and send me over the EPS file. I don't think you should use Corel. I don't use Corel. You should. So how many out there in the comments that use any type of vector art? What is your go-to as far as your program? I'll tell you what let's, mine is. Let's see how many people. I'm sure there's other there's other programs other than Corel and Illustrator, but I'm just curious to see what's the there is people using. Affinity. Affinity is a big one. Inkscape. And Adobe. We have, well. we have one vote for Illustrator. I don't We've got that. Affinity, GIMP, MS Paint, Kit Picks, and Corel. And that comes from Matthew Enderly. I don't see any of those comments, Justin. I don't know what you're looking at. <laughs> oh, Maldo, you break my heart. Is he a Corel guy? Vote. I default to Corel because A, it's tied so deep into Wilcom, and B, I'm not a real graphic designer. <laughs> uh, we got a AI Corel or Affinity. So we got uh, someone that uses all three. I think Mike is my spirit animal because I'm also not a graphics designer and I use Corel too. Um, all right. So we have this done. And you can see that I've got some objects hanging in here that just need some trims put on them. Um, I don't want it to render those nodes, so I'm just going to add trims. 
make sure that they're not there. Um, if you leave them in, it will draw a line between them. Ask me how I know. <laughs> um, so I'll go ahead and go over here. And this is what I was working on before I sent it over to Justin. And uh, one of the neater things, I think it's really neat, uh, with polls is that if you select multiple objects, you can edit the start and stop points um, on all the objects at the same time. So I think that that's really. No, in Pulse, is there a, a hot key that just does closest point connection? It just does what? Closest point connection. Uh, probably. <laughs> I know. I know that's not the case. answer you were looking for, but. In Wilcom, I think it's J. Yep. That you hit that everything that you have selected, it'll go closest point connection. Again, yep. computer kind of picks some wonky stuff sometimes, but if I am kind of going through it, like like Jeff's doing where there's multiple areas I want to change, I'll do that just to kind of get them in the vicinity so I'm not grabbing points from here and moving them down here. Everything kind of goes in the general area that I'm thinking of doing. And then I'll go in there and do the micro adjusting. All right. So Cindy says illustrator. Damn. So I think there's more illustrators in this than Corel. So I'm sure there are, but it breaks my heart. It's okay. I'll survive till next week. <laughs> all right so now i'm happy with all the start and stop points um i'm going to come up here and i'm going to take the art itself and unlock it yeah see that's i'm pretty sure that was one font because these larger letters that came in by themselves i didn't have issues with so i'm going to select all the artwork because i don't want to send the artwork out to the file um, and then we have, uh, our art and we, I, my fill densities point, put it a point four, and you said double it. I would, go point point, I would go point eight and see where we're at. We may have to go a little bit more, but once I get the EPS in there and I'll take a look at it. I'll fight you and do a one. <laughs> I'm adding point two more. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. Let's go with one. That's fine. Oh, okay. I was going to change it back, but we'll go with one. No, I it, honestly, once I get it in on screen, we may find that we have to even go more because I remember when we did the first shirts, uh, the original file that we outputted that we thought would be loose enough, we actually had to go even more. So Matthew says, if we get pe three people to say Illustrator or Corel, Adam gets to throw a pie at Jeff's face. We're not doing that again. <laughs> he, you're checking to see if he's in the room. He is in the room. He's right <laughs> there. Matt. Hi. Get your pie ready, Just Adam. Just prove I'm in the room. Get your pie ready, Adam. Eh, we'll save that till pie day. It's past pie day. Aww. Yes. You missed it. You missed it about uh, actually a week ago. So right now I'm looking at the um, stitches before I export them here. I had one where it was sitting. We The run stitch came up. It jumped out here and it didn't come down. So I just edited that. I'm looking at for any other things that I may want to edit here. And I'm not seeing very much more. We're going to check this, these two objects here. Um, this object. I'm going to end there and the start point is up here. And so that's causing that weird jump that you see right there. Mm -hmm. So to fix it, I'm just going to move this triangle up to there and that should regenerate the stitches. And so that'll get rid of that. And when Justin gets this art in, he can change it to, he can ed edit those nodes if he needs to. So right now I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to convert the segment to, uh, actually I'm going to process it outline to stitch segments. So then now this saves every individual needle penetration like a DST file. So if I was in another software program, um, 
I would export the file out as a DST, import it back in, and then I would convert it to vector. But because this has that functionality, I can just now right click on it. I can process it and turn it into um, stitches. And then I can go ahead and do stitches to artwork. And so now I'm left with this vector. Um, to save out the vector, I will go into Corel Fusion mode and hope it works because this is the version of Corel that <laughs> did not like. There we go. It's going to render this out for us. And I'm just going to pull it up here onto the page there, and then I'm going to save it. Um, and this is one thing that I was really surprised with is I can't save it as an EPS file by default. I can save it as a, a CDR or an AI, which I guess you would just, you could just use a straight AI file. Yeah, I should be able to use that. I'll save that as an AI file. And then I will come over here and upload it to Justin, who will download it. I think you got one more okay there. I'm like, it's not working, Justin. <laughs> it is a fairly large file. <laughs> For some says, reasons. Mulda says, I believe you have to export to EPS, not save as. You guys are talking Corel talk now. We are. Um, but because this is... Corel inside of Pulse, I actually don't get the option to export. So I can either save it, import, switch, or close. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close that object out, and I will come back to the stitches, and I will undo a few times. Going back to Satin Pass. And now Justin will tell me whether or not it needs... any adjustments and there we go just had to re-render everything and i'm going to drop that out while justin pulls everything up and lets me know if we need to edit the density at all we will and i'll show everybody here what i'm talking about all right okay so this is actually the original file that he sent me over and this is at the the regular 0.4 density so looking at these stitches, I mean, on screen, it kind of still gives you that embroidery look. You can tell that it's a, a rendering of stitches. Uh, but when you get into screen printing, you know, especially when you're getting into, say, white on a dark shirt, white print on a black shirt, you are having to do multiple layers of white ink to make sure that it's, it's a, you know, a nice solid print on a dark shirt unless you are looking for something that's distressed or a little bit the faded look um old school look to it then you can get away with you know just hitting a white print on a on a dark shirt just once but you know something we're, we're trying to go for something that's more stand out print solid print so um white you are going to go into several layers to get that that opaque print. You're gonna have a, a layer, you're gonna flash, which is a, a quick drying method, and then you're gonna hit that white again. So um, having these stitches in here that are close, this close together, uh, a lot of these stitches, especially in the center here, where it kind of shows those stitches getting closer together and more dense in those areas, that's gonna just fill in. So I don't think we're gonna have the, the effect that you were looking for. We're trying to over exaggerate this look to to make sure that everybody knows the print that is, is embroidery. So we're trying to look for that faux embroidery look, uh, but in screen print. So just kind of backing out here. This is the newer file that he just gave me. Uh, it's it's definitely opened up quite a bit more. Um, actually, this one this one might look okay a lot of times too when i'm when i'm looking at this fine stuff if i'm kind of teeter-tottering to see if it is detail that's going to work in screen print or if there's areas i need to enhance or make bolder or something like that 
when it is borderline, there's sometimes where I actually have to, to print it out, see it to scale, see if it is something where I'm thinking that either the screen mesh that I'm using is not going to hold the detail and or is it going to be, you know, too much going on where it's just going to kind of bleed together and, and make one big solid ob object. I'm thinking, what did we do? We did one. Uh, we did point eight. I ended up doing point eight. Point eight. Okay. So yep. maybe if we if we bumped it up to one, maybe leave the dot at point eight because I don't want to lose the that dot shape altogether. Uh, but some of those areas, like especially like when it's turning these corners, you got some dense areas in there. Um, it might just kind of open it up. So. And this again, this is this is stuff where if I really wanted to, I can come in here because he has given me a vector object. Uh, this isn't a raster object. This actually comes through and actually treats it as strokes. Um, so I can come in. It's a stroke color. I can come in and, and change the individual elements to different colors if I want to, if we wanted to do a multicolor design. Um, and it is kind of treating it how exactly each element that he digitized separately. So that's a that's a nice feature that Pulse and Wilcom will output in these in these vector files. So, so um, I sent you a version two, Justin. Um, I scaled it up a bit, <laughs> and then I set the density to one point two because um, that I also didn't want to lose that eye. Uh, so I tried scaling it up to see if that would fix it. So we'll see. You can check it there and let me know if I need to increase the density at all or open it up more, I guess. Um, and I can do that while you're showing stuff. I think that's going to... I think that's going to work perfectly. All but right. Gonna, yeah. So Let's for everybody much. playing at home, that was a density of a 1.2. <laughs> As you can see here, the difference between a 0.4, which again on screen still has that that neat, you know, simulated stitch look to it. And if we were, you know, maybe using this for an output for a PNG file or something like that, if we're using it on social media or something like that, it's going to hold that that stitch look uh, in the <clears throat> resolution that you need for for things like that. If it's an an email tagline or something you're doing on a website. Uh, something like that, I think, is going to have a, a better effect to it, where it's going to look like kind of a solid embroidered uh, design, kind of similar to what we were talking about last week, as far as presenting a a sample, a sewn sample, as your sample to to somebody. Uh, something down here. Again, we're getting closer. I was just worried about these kind of denser areas when it's turning corners to make sure that that doesn't just kind of glob together when you're screen printing. Um, so opening it up. And if I remember, here. Justin, last year we had to increase the stroke width too because it was way too narrow. Correct. And uh, and we were dealing with the, the embroidery nerd spelled out in one line. So we were looking at something that was a lot less uh, bold, a lot, you know, a lot less tall. Yep. Excuse me. Um, so I think this would be good, but again, because it is vector artwork, I could come in here and change the stroke width if I really wanted to. But again, you're kind of fighting against what we did as far as loosening that density because increasing those strokes are going to decrease the space between each of those stitches. So again, kind of running stitches. into the same problem. <laughs> yeah, stitches. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a, a, a really neat, I'm going to change this to 10 inches because we talked about doing 10 inches. It's a neat feature. Um, I kind of like how we were talking about. It's going to show the, the travel stitches between the two elements, like in the T and the H there. I kind of like that. I think it's kind of a, a unique touch to kind of show the workings of the digitizing. Yeah, it's definitely different. And, you know, honestly, before, I don't think I've ever seen this style done. Um, except for what we've done. Now, we could, if we were doing like DTF or some other non-screen print, 
we could take it and um, render it in the 3D and export the virtual decoration. And then you would print that on a physical media and you would be exactly. able to see that. But with where we're doing um, screen print, if we tried to do like a 3D render, it would immediately be lost because the ink would blend. Am I right, Justin? Yeah, and not to mention in those 3D rendering, you know, if you know, did you digitize this in blue, that 3D rendering, if we output it in that, you're probably gonna have at least three or four different shades of blue. So now screen printing is gonna add more screens, more cost involved. Um, so yeah, uh, the, getting the, the vector art, doing this in a one color, this is just giving me a, you know, something that I'm not gonna have to manipulate very much to get it to screen and to press, which makes it your life easier on a, uh, a screen printer, so. Yeah, and this too, like if you guys wanna do something like this for your business, when you have the vector and it's out, you know, it's really the, the stitch segments that I digitize it in, like Justin shown, those are the individual vector lines that are now in the file and you can manipulate it further in an art program if you, if you need it to. But exactly when you actually go into the whole plotting of the stitches, um, the software, you know, they spend a lot of money to be able to do that. <laughs> and, and it does a pretty good job um, by itself. So, yeah. And this, this actually comes in as, as nodes, like where the ends of those stitches are. So if I really wanted to, I can come in here if we wanted to, do something weird to it and, and actually manipulate it in a vector art. You know, if I wanted to show a mistake in the digitizing or something like that, or, or even you using want to add this, a mistake to the digitizing. Yeah. You, using this as a tool is even a teaching tool. Um, if you are bringing designs into an art program and you are, you know, creating a presentation or an instructional uh, manual or something like that in a class, this is something where you can kind of bring in quickly, change some stuff around so you can show like, you know, if you don't do this technique or this is how you can change certain nodes, it's something that you can quickly do in Illustrator or Corral. <laughs> you know, and I know um, when I did this last year, when you, when you have your start point and your stop point and at the center of your design, you export a DST and I, then I was bringing the DST back into Wilcom and I was converting it to vector. I had that long line that would go from the center of the start point all the way to the very first stitch or from the very last spot back to the center. And so I was able to go in there and I was able to remove nodes, weird, no, weird lock stitch locations. I was able to remove that kind of stuff post-processing. Um, the pulse that actually exports, exported the vector a lot cleaner then uh it was the last the last time i did this and so there were a lot less things that needed to be touched up by justin um and i don't really see much in that file that that really needs to be cleaned up anyways so and 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 if anything if if jeff and i decide you know you know we really don't want these travel stitches instead of him having to go in and having to choose start and stop points or having to trim every single element I could easily, easily enough to, if it is, you know, since this is vector, I can come in and find those points that are those travel stitches and just eliminate them myself. That'd probably be something that's a little bit quicker than, uh, than Jeff trying to trick the embroidery program into not having any travel stitches or, or jump stitches or anything like that. So, I mean, I, I can honestly tell you, I like having a little bit of travel stitches in there. I don't like having a ton because I think you lose it, but I think the travel stitch is really for us, the people that do embroidery, that that really signifies to us that this is actually stitches being plotted versus somebody drawing squiggly lines on a... Um, or even versus, you know, there are these um, virtual, depending on what software you're, you're working with, they're either called scripts or there's, there's different plugins that you can use in like Photoshop and stuff where you actually just take, you can go online, find these plugins that you, that you actually purchase. Um, you could have a plugin that creates uh, a logo and transforms it into something that looks like metal or something that looks like chalk. Um, there are a few out there that I've seen that actually converted to embroidery. When you zoom into those, you can completely see that it's not stitches. Um, but I mean, it is a good rendering if you are looking for something that's just quick to like for social media or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think 
I think these travel lines and kind of shows that it is an actual digitized file. So it kind of gives it a, a cool look. So, yep. And I can't tell you, Justin, I have, um, I've done digital. I, I wrote an article where I use exports of pitches into vector and use that for all of the teaching material. And it came out really, really nice. Um, and I was really happy with it. And it, it definitely illustrated, you know, the point that I was trying to make of how this would all be done. Um, and it came out really, really clean. So uh, I think with that, did you have to add any stroke to that or width to that? Or you'll you'll do that when you get ready? To no, I, I think that last one you sent me is going to work out great. Again, I will double check when, when I actually get it on, on film and get it in front of me to size. But um, I think we're good to go. So. All right, that was a 0.5 stroke for all of those playing at home. Uh, when I looked at that, just so you guys can get all the settings too. Um, yeah. But sometimes it is a trial and error process and you need to go through it. So that's pretty much all we had to cover, guys, um, unless you wanted to jump over anything else, Justin. No, I think uh, the next step is, is uh, I'll put together um, the store so we can have it go live and have every opportunity for everybody to place an order. I think what we'll do is like in previous years, we'll have uh, t-shirts, um, some hoodies. I know hoodies are a popular item. And uh, once we have that go live here in the next week or so, we'll definitely post it up in all our socials in the group. And so we can get uh, get you guys some M Nerd 2023 t-shirts. Yep, and remember, Justin said the key thing there, 2023, as in this design will not be Again, um, we're going to come up with something else in 2024 and 2025. And probably some point we might stop doing the year stuff. But for the first, as long as we can, we're going to try to keep it exclusive to the year so that you guys can collect them at home and get all of them. But Yeah, so we, we only do this once a year. Um, I think we'll, we'll discuss how long we have the store open. I think we usually do it for three, four weeks. It uh, gives everybody a chance to, to place your orders. At the end, it's a kind of a pre-order thing. At the end, we'll we'll fill all the orders, get them shipped out to you. Um, and again, this this does help. We're not doing it, you know, for profit. It just helps us, you know, recoup some of the expenses that we have for the group, you know, the lives that we do and whatnot. So when you are purchasing these, you are representing, you know, the embroidery nerd, and you are helping out with the the cost involved with, with, with what we do. So we do uh, greatly appreciate it. All right. Well, guys, with that, um, we guys got to see how you can convert embroidery to vector as well as digitize it a little bit. Um, I, if you guys do try it, uh, I'd love to see it. Post it up in the group and, and let us take a look. Absolutely. Um, but with that, I'm Jeff Fuller from Fuller Embroidery Works. That is Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios. We're both here representing the Embroidery Nerd, and we will catch you guys next time. Good night, guys.